Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're overloaded with Scotsman this week. No Benji. So former Scotland captain Greg Laidlaw joins us to preview Scotland, France. How are you doing, Greg? Hi, guys. I'm very well, thank you. Former Claremont on Scrum Half as well, but now in Japan. We had you on about a year ago, so still in Japan, still enjoying it? Yeah, still out here, uh, Tim. Still very much enjoying it. It's uh, a little bit disrupted uh, the season at the moment due to COVID, sadly, but hopefully we're going to get over that. The cases seem to be coming down across the, the country now. So, yeah, very much enjoying it, enjoying the rugby. Uh, it's, it's definitely a shorter season, enjoying that side of it as well. So, yeah, still awesome to be, to be out on the field uh, training and, and playing as well. Half the number of games, twice the end, Johnny. Twice the end. <laughs> Say no more. 100%. <laughs> You'll be going till he's 45 at this rate. 100%. <laughs> and how are you, Johnny? You went skiing last week, didn't you? I did, Breaking so the legs? Uh, no, no. Uh, I didn't do any skiing. I basically did apres ski and pre-ski uh, and coffeeing and beersing. Uh, but we, we basically took the kids up. It's two weeks off school holidays here. So we took the kids down to Baquera in Spain in the Pyrenees. Um, really nice just to get a break, change of scene, um, and it's beautiful down there. Like, it's absolutely stunning. But no, we basically just took them to ski school, and our youngest is one. So Jen and I took turns of looking after him as he caused absolute chaos on the side of the slopes. Um, but no, it was good. But for us, it was more just having a beer and a glass of wine and enjoying the food. And as I said, a change of scene, but it was very, very cool. A nice part of the world. And now I'm thankful to be here with you guys and not with my kids, because after one and a half weeks, as Greg knows, it gets a bit <laughs> a bit much. Um, so we've got, what, another three days to go for me, and then I'll be back to Edinburgh for Scotland, France, hospitality and commentary, all that stuff. So looking forward to the end of the holidays, a few more days with them, and then fleeing and getting to Edinburgh and enjoying some rugby. And before we move on to the Six Nations, how is the rugby over there? You mentioned the season's quite disrupted because of COVID, but the standard? Standard's very good. Tim, I think, you know, there's quite a lot of highlights and stuff flying about on, on world rugby feeds and stuff like that. And, you know, some of the tries that he scored are, are pretty ridiculous. Um, so it's, it's great fun to play. And they, they really do play that, that sort of real positive uh, frame of mind. You know, every team kind of plays the same. There's a few teams, obviously, with a little bit more power, but very much like free flowing, trying to be real positive with the ball and kind of attack from anywhere. So, yeah, it's really exciting. And, uh, you know, it's been an awesome challenge for me, you know, especially I'm, I'm not young anymore so you know I've been having to you know bash out the extra fitness and what have you on, on the field to keep up with these young kids but you know trying to hand my, my knowledge on to them and it's very much part of my job out here which which I'm really enjoying. And obviously you're taking it very seriously and the standard is good but I've read recently you were talking about the pressure of being Scotland captain is a bit more relaxed for you over there you're enjoying life a bit more? Yeah definitely, definitely. that's you know mm-hmm. when you when you sort of look back and, and certainly when I was you know Scotland captain you always all you want to do is win you know and and I think, you know, it, it gets difficult at certain times. Obviously, you can't win every game and certainly certainly don't play for Scotland a lot of the times. Uh, you know, and Johnny, Johnny will tell you that. It's, it's difficult. But um, so, yeah, really loving, you know, just having a little bit of step back, being able to get away from that sort of pressured environment week in, week out, really, you know, essentially get back to doing what you do when you're young and really enjoying the game of rugby. And I've really sort of been rejuvenated since I came out here. Uh, you know, I go a lot of training you know, get a smile on my face, you know, and get out of there and play rugby. So you're having really enjoying that side of it. Well, let's move on to the Six Nations then. Scotland, France this weekend. Johnny, we spoke about it last week and you were talking about the formula to beat this France side. So how do you think they'll approach it, Scotland, Greg? Um, I think to the, and I heard Beach talking about it in the podcast last week, yeah, you know, very much the same sort of mindset. Scotland got to have to play quick. Uh, you know, I think he talked about staying away from the, the blitz. Uh, be too <laughs> easier said than done, I guess. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that, that's essentially the template. But I don't think Scotland are clearly going to respect France because they're playing awesome at the moment. You, you don't beat teams like New Zealand and, and Ireland, who are also playing excellent uh, at this moment in time. You don't beat teams that are unless you're really good. But Scotland have played uh, and probably won against France the last two or three times they played them. Uh, and, and for a reason. So Scotland can win. They're going to have to have a, a real 80-minute performance or, or uh, top-draw performance uh, to win the game. They, they need to play skillful. They, they need to be disciplined and they need to, to move the ball as much as they can away from the, the big, heavy French back. They don't let them settle. Don't let them get in the rhythm. If they can do that, they're in with a chance. Last time at Murrayfield, we saw Adam Hastings actually come up with an amazing kicking display, cross-field kicks. 
like firing behind wingers, finding space, turning them constantly. Um, and then again, last year in Paris, it was completely different. It was absolutely hosing it down. It was about scrum achieving parity. There's a big lineup performance by Grant Gilchrist, applying pressure a different way at Mall. But like France have such a big imposing pack. It looks like it's going to be clear and not too messy weather-wise this weekend. But so do you think France and sort of physicality and pure power have a bit of an upper hand? When it comes to pure power state speeds, yes, they will. Certainly over the eight minutes, Scotland have got a good pack of forwards for sure. They're you know, well coached, um, but they're going to have to properly perform uh, for 80 minutes. And the thing with France is as well, uh, it's probably their bench also as well. You know, Taufi Fenua, uh, Bamba, uh, Mauvaka, guys like that coming on, you know, with 20, 30 minutes to go, they, they make such a difference. Uh, obviously, Scotland do have a strong bench as well, but it just that grind, you know what it's like in every scrum. They've got, you know, Valenza in there, um, Uli Antonio on the tight head, the big, big man. And just if they keep coming at you for 80 minutes, uh, it makes it really difficult. So hopefully the weather can hold because I think, you know, if it was, you know, heavy rain or whatever, that, that's probably going to suit France a little bit more. And I know that might sound funny because France can obviously play as well, but Scotland would probably get out muscled, you know, over 80 minutes if, if it was heavy rain. And, uh, so hopefully we'll get lucky up in Edinburgh uh, going into the game, if we can do that. And then that allows Scotland to play that that sort of speed of ball as well. If we can create, they've got to create a quick ball from Rux, get the ball away from there, get it into Finn's hands, and, and he can really hurt you know, France with, it, with his passing. But you, you mentioned you know Adam Hastings' kicking game. Finn can really hurt uh, France with, with his kicking game as well and, uh, and get the ball in behind them. Is that the balance, Johnny? Because you were talking about last week, keeping the ball away from France and, and doing a lot of kicking. So what are we going to expect from Scotland? I would almost refuse the physical battle. I know it sounds really weird, but if you try and take them on in the middle of the park, go into multi-phase, you're going to come unstuck um, because they're so big. They're so powerful. They're so good on the deck as well. You look at the counter wrecking, the amount of people that can contest the ball in their pack and across their back line as well. Um, so I think a lot, when it gets to multi-phase, they will be a lot of a lot of kicking to the sky, a lot of contesting, a lot of testing their wingers in the air. Uh, I think again, a lot of cross field kicks, getting in behind them, um, leaving wingers trailing on sidelines, trying to beat them into those tram lines and, and 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 win quick, easy ball in those areas. But I don't see Scotland, you know, playing out of their third, playing out of their forty at all, um, playing really smart, really pragmatic rugby. Because if you're going to beat France, you have to get into the right areas of the field and execute. And they, to be fair, they did that against England. By the skin of their teeth and I mean by that and no more and that you can't have that little possession of territory and expect to win games so again that showed when they went down to Cardiff they weren't accurate but France is a different ball game in terms of the athletes in terms of the organization that you're playing against this French national team is a serious team um, Scotland will take confidence from the fact they've beaten them the last two times but I think this will be a huge test for them um, and Murrayfield, you look at all the games have been won essentially by the big teams at home so far. Like that might be the other thing that carries Scotland through. But if you look at and the tactical battles, Gregor has won the last two against Fabian. Um, but you think as coaches are constantly evolving and getting better, and I think Fabian showed with his side and the steps they've taken with Sean as well defensively, and um, they're really kicking on. So it's going to be hell of a hard for Scotland this weekend. But for me, if they're going to win the game or beat France at all. Uh, it'll be tactical kicking. It'll be constantly Finn looking over their first defensive line, chip kicking, turning them, trying to slow their defensive line, keep them second guessing. Be loads of little technical and tactical elements to their kicking game um, to slow France down, but it'll be extremely hard. Scotland could probably look at, um, you know, certainly fast out to the Ireland's performance and the way they played. And certainly in around that, um, you know, start of the second half, the way Ireland were able to sort of, you know, hit that put a three forwards off, off the sideline and, you know, tug it to the 10 and, and they were able to get some bodies into space. Um, so, and, and they sort of done that, not just on one occasion. Um, so I think that's that's the sort of template that, that, as we talked about, getting the ball away from the heavy forwards, making them move, because that's probably one area France has really improved on, um, you know, as they've got, you know, uh, with Cyril Bay or, or, or Julian Marshall, and, uh, a couple of guys in there who could get around the park a bit better now than, probably what they've had at their disposal in the past. So um, Scotland, again, they've got to be skillful and they've got to have to be able to produce that over 80 minutes. And I'm not, I truly believe if they can do that, yeah, they can get going. And, and I think getting the, if you can get a couple of big ball carriers in the wider channels as well, 
think, you know, probably Hamish has probably been a little bit frustrated. We've not seen him uh, carry as much as he's probably a bit more marked <laughs> nowadays, like, like everything else. But um, I still think if you can get him in the wider channels, he, he can cause some damage. I think Duan Van der Merve, he's, he's probably a little bit frustrated as well. He's, he's not had as much ball as Darcy Graham. So he's probably due a big performance. So hopefully we can get his hands on the ball in, in, in some sort of, you know, less cluttered areas. If you can do that, that's where, you know, Hamish, uh, Duan, these guys, uh, they become really dangerous. And, and I thought Hoggy looked pretty dangerous uh, <clears throat> also against Wales. Uh, you know, he was able to beat that first defender. We, were, we just weren't able to get anybody close to him to pick up an offload. You know, so he's always dangerous. So if he can keep doing that, if he can get bodies in, in and around him close, get a, a quick offload away, that's going to keep speeding the play and, and really help us out. Johnny mentioned the line out last year and Grant Gilchrist, you mentioned Johnny. He's there, Sam Skinner's there, but no Johnny Gray, no Scott Cummings. How much are they going to be missed? Uh, not massively is the honest answer. And that they haven't, like, obviously they make the tackles and, but, you know, big dominant ball carries and, Dominance hasn't really been there, I wouldn't say. Um, they've soaked really well. But I, I think if Sam Skinner comes, like Sam's been exceptional for Exeter. I was down working at one of his games, Exeter against Montpellier. He's, he's a proper rugby player. Um, and so I guess in the past, you'd have had these guys slip out or Richie Gay, Richie, Richie Gay, Richie Gray might have come in. Um, but he's made himself unavailable. Um, but Sam Skinner is a, a really, really capable and, de- and decent second row in his own right. So th- those aren't too big of a loss for me. Also, Gilco would be the bigger loss. Um, he's the line-out caller and leader, um, and Sam Skinner comes in and, and fills, a, fills a spot, which is a be aggressive, be abrasive, get around and try and get amongst this French pack. But I, I don't think that that's a massive loss for, for Scotland. So is it the depth, Greg? Because with those two missing, you mentioned France will have Roman Taufi-Fanua coming off the bench. Perhaps there's not quite the same depth for Scotland. Yeah, well, yeah. I think obviously when you start picking up a couple of injuries as well, you know, Tim and, um, you know, over the sort of Six Nations period and France have probably had to experience that, yeah, but you can see it already now kicking in a little bit for Scotland. We obviously lost Jamie, Jamie Ritchie in, in, in game one, who, you know, already we've had to move a couple of players around to, to probably try and cover him up, you know, use Sam Skinner in a, in a different way and, you know, get him into the second row. And, and as Pete said, he's, he's an excellent player and, and, you know, he's probably going to, he would have started anyway on another day so you're not going to lose too much but you know once he's you start I think Scotland have brought in um is it Marshall Sykes and uh, certainly into the squad and you know that's going to be his first involvement you know and and beats I'll tell you you know uh Tau or somebody like that he's you know 130 odd kilos and a lot of carbs a lot of experience and the rest just that power game yeah and the rest as well so um, <laughs> there's a program weight and there's a real weight Greek we know that both from France <laughs> yeah exactly but I think Scotland are fairly settled still, uh, which will help the, the young guys coming in. They're obviously good players that they're getting pulled into the squad. But you look at our French team as well; they, they are really settled, and I think that that goes such a long way in, in the international uh, rugby. You know, if you go that settled environment, you know people know what everybody's all about, uh, and it's just that sort of easy transition. You know, when when somebody does come on, you know, when, whenever they get substituted onto the field, it's it's a seamless transition, and, and you can see. France have got that at the moment. Nothing really changes, you know, when, when they do make changes. And speaking of people that are settled, there's obviously in fallow weeks, people get a rest. Our old mate Finn Russell was back with Rassing. Really, really impressive win for them away to Bordeaux. He's getting abused for a shirt off um, in the oh. selfie in the change room afterwards. What do you make about the battles? You've got Finn, again, you love playing with him. Good man as well, going up against Intermac, one of the best in the world. Again, what do you make of both? You've played against both of them. What do you make of both and how do you... What do you make of the head-to-head that's going to happen this weekend at Murrayfield? Oh, really exciting again, isn't it? Similar, I guess, to uh, Scotland v England. And, you know, Marcus Smith was, was coming in up against him, and, and that was an interesting ball and a really good, uh, you know, game within the game. Essentially, so it's going to be another one of them this weekend. That that's what's difficult about your players that play outside of Scotland. Uh, I, I briefly spoke to Finn on text uh, the, the other night. There, he obviously was back in the, the old nine o'clock on a Sunday night against Bordeaux. Um, so, but uh, he's uh, he's safe and well. He's he's back in Scotland, so thankfully he's not picked up uh, any injuries. And uh, he was looking lovely again with his stop off uh, in the change room after it. So, uh, you know, you can look you can look like whatever you want to look like when you're as good as Finn. So, um, and then obviously uh, Roman Antimac, yeah, excellent player. Uh, got obviously building that really strong partnership with uh, with Dupont and the side him and his club mate 
So it looks really comfortable. Uh, again, in that in that French team, you know, we mentioned uh, just slightly earlier how, how they look really settled, settled, um, and you, you can see that in the way he plays as well. He's, he's real sort of confident and, and comfortable with, with who's round about him. And I guess he's a similar player in many ways to uh, defending. Maybe he doesn't chuck as many, you know, offloads and stuff, but he, he can be flashy. You know, he can do outstanding things. He can do simple things really well. Uh, you know, he, he's running the ball out from, you know, his, his own dead ball area against All Blacks. Uh, you, you can knock over crossfield kicks, a real dangerous player. And, and you saw that from that, you know, first couple of minutes in the game against Ireland, making that half break and chucking a lovely offload on the inside. So I think it's a big test for them coming to, to Murrayfield, uh, to be honest. I think Scotland will probably target them. Or probably target, not target, but you know, put pressure on the on the on both of the halfbacks. If you can get some momentum in the game, there, try and squeeze them and, and frustrate them. That could be one avenue uh, into the game. And you know, seeing Finn going up against uh, him, and then also the you know other French backs, you know, Gail Pricu that you'll know uh, so well from playing at the same club in France. It's going to be an interesting battle. Just touching on Finn and your relationship with him, it might be difficult for you to say, but I think it's fair that you're pretty different characters. So did you bring the best out of him and vice versa as well when you played together? Oh, you love to ask Finn about if I brought the best out of him, you'll probably say not, but um, <laughs> oh, he, certainly brought, he certainly brought the best out of me. There's no denying that. And we are completely different characters, but again, I think that, that's why we got on so well you know, because, you know, I was, I was a sort of, you know, certainly a little bit more serious <laughs> when it came to the rugby stuff, which is just the way I was, but, yeah, when he came into the Scotland setup, I think he sort of he almost kind of reminded me a little bit, you know, what, what it's all about, and you know, try not to take it so seriously, and then try and enjoy it as best you can. And and I certainly really enjoyed, you know, getting to know and, and getting to play with him. And you know, I think he always just appreciated my honesty, you know, and uh, you know, always tried to you know keep him keep him in the tracks as, as much as he could. But in the same breath, you know, you know, let him go and do his stuff as well. And that was just, I think that was probably where we got to his. You know, some of the times he'd call for the ball, I, I just wouldn't give him it because I knew, I knew it wasn't on. But other times, I'd you know, I'd, I'd say, yeah, here you go and go and do your thing. And um, so now we had we had great fun together, and it's awesome to see him and in that sort of role now as, as a leader of the Scotland team because he really is. You can see he's driving the attack, and um, and, and you can see that the players look down for that leadership and, and direction on the field, and and he's really stepping up. So it's awesome to see, and you know, he's, he's been kicking really well at, at post as well. Well, people might not know he's not really frontline kicker for for Rassin as well, so you know it's not an easy thing to do. So he's kicked extremely well so far. So you know there's no reason why he can't keep that going. And yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to him playing again this weekend. And you know Finn better than most, as you mentioned. But now, as a Scotsman based in France, after the disappointment of Cardiff, how motivated do you think he will be at ten as a leader for this side to try and get one over the French and some of his teammates this weekend at Murrayfield? Yeah, he'll be he'll be hugely motivated now. It's probably, you know, even after that disappointment uh, down in Cardiff, I think sometimes it's a good thing you get to go back to to Rassen and play another game and get it flushed out of your system. And, and and like you, Beats, you'll know what it's like, you know, going back into Scotland camp to then go back over to France. You, you want to do well and you want to win. I remember um, playing for, for Clermont, I think it was 20... In 17 or 2018, we were man- managed to beat them at Murrayfield when I was playing at Claremont. You know, it was just uh, such an awesome feeling. You know, when, you, when you're going to head back over to France, you can, you know, sort of walk in, you know, push your chest out and, and all that sort of banter and have a laugh with the boys. And, you know, the, the way Finn is, you know, he'll be he'll be putting himself out there to, to try and get the win this weekend. And, you know, it, it'd be awesome to be a fly in the wall in the chain room uh, back in the uh, Rass and the band. He'll be giving the boys it if he's able to do it. And it seems odd to ask, but two yellows and a red in his last seven Six Nations games. I mean, is there an issue there? It, all eyes will be on him this weekend, obviously, after what happened in Cardiff. Oh, there's certainly no issue. Uh, that's for sure. He, he, as I said, he, I think he's really grown in that sort of leadership role uh, within the team. And he was... He's, he's really good at picking intercepts, when, to, be, to be fair. I mean, he, he, everybody's seen it. And the, the damage is probably already done in, in, in the one in Cardiff at the weekend. Where, you know... I think, you know, Dan Bigger took that penalty at the post and it, the old classic, you know, it hit the post and nobody reacted and, and the Wales picked the ball back up and that's why they actually they got the field position. So we were under the pump, you know, he, he's tried to come out the line and grab it and, and rein the ball in. Unfortunately, it's not worked in, in this time around, but 
Uh, there's certainly no issue there. Uh, and that, that's a great thing about Finn's character. He'll, he will be annoyed. He's picked up the yellow card, but, you know, he won't let it bother him. He'll, he'll just get on, with it, get on with his job. And, you know, I, I know how much he'll be, he'll be looking forward to, to pulling the Scotland jersey back on and getting out there at Murrayfield this weekend. And you mentioned earlier the pressure that Scotland would have to put on Intermac and Antoine Dupont. Um, as a former scrum half, not a bad one at that. Give us your, what do you make of Antoine? I know he's the world player of the year, but what do you make of his game in general? What bits do you most enjoy? And if you're Gregor and you're the coaching staff, how do you try and pressurise Antoine Dupont? What do I enjoy? Um, I enjoy, you know, when, when he runs and takes on the big boys. And I think that's why that's why a lot of the big boys miss sort of tackles on them or fall off tackles. They don't realise how strong he actually is. Um, you know, it might be funny to, to, to sort of hear it, but all of his strengths in it, like in his legs mainly, you know, he's got that sort of low centre center of gravity, uh, you know, whereas a lot of boys will have real strong fans and, and stuff, but he's got like real strong legs, low centre of gravity, and, and he can sort of pump his legs through contact as well as a fairly good handoff. And I think a lot of boys end up going higher on him and he really he can fend them, but he keeps his legs going through contact. So, uh, that's probably one of the bits I really enjoy. He's brave as well, you know. For a small guy, it's always nice to see it. he really does get stuck in, and I think he's 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 definitely leading that French team team really well and and, and leading it from the front. Uh, also, I think how you put pressure on him is you know your first two defenders uh, from the ruck, you know whatever you call them or you know A or B or you know guard whatever you everybody's got different names for them these days, but they've got to really be switched on every single breakdown. Uh, and come forward as well. I think a lot of forwards get scared, you know, from, from nine to that, who've, who've got speed, who've got strength, but they don't come forward and, and don't take his face away. And, that, and that's the worst thing he can do. If you, if you sit off him, if you're indecisive, he, he, he will be decisive, and that's when he's going to take space. And, uh, you know, if he doesn't take space himself or go through, he'll put other people into space with an offload. So you know, they first two defenders, either side of the ruck, got to come up, take two steps forward, put pressure on, force him to play the ball early. And then if you can do that, you can negate some of his dangerous play. I remember Fabian Galti as well, whenever we played against a decent nine, so we played against Morgan Parra, Clermont, like whoever it was in top 14 weren't Montpellier, he'd be like, two steps forward and then just take the nine. He was like, in any case, you're slowing the game down. Don't let him get to the next ruck. Limit his involvement by just getting him on the deck. As much as you can get him on the floor and out of the game, it doesn't matter if it's a prop or a second row, but whoever it is in those first two positions, come forward, take space. And if you can get man and ball, get him on the deck and just get him out of the game. And I think that's for all teams. Like the less he is in the game, the more chance you've got of winning it. Because the more touches he has on the ball, he's that good. The more damage. You, and you see as well, support lines, even after the ball has gone away, the amount of tries he scores from his tracking, uh, just from running simple but smart follow-up lines. Again, that's it. It's just check him, get him out of the way. But for all teams, he's just so hard to stop. Because even if you try and bump him as the ball is going, he'd sit you down. Like He's that strong, as you mentioned. So... I don't know. He's been a joy to watch. So good luck to the Scottish defence this weekend. That's all I can say. Yeah, he is awesome to watch, uh, to be fair to him. But, uh, you know, and that's, that's when it comes back to the Scot uh, Scotland side a little bit. And, and two things, and they can hold their discipline. Uh, you know, don't give fans set pieces and, and uh, you know, line out to launch off. Uh, and that can frustrate them as well. Uh, and really holding the ball in attack. If they can hold the ball in attack, you know, the less, the, the less time France are obviously, obviously going to have to attack and the less dangerous he becomes. Make him defend, make him tackle, and don't get, don't let him get his hands on the ball. Easier said than done. And aside from wearing yellow dressing gowns and GQ, which I'm guessing Greg probably never would have done, Johnny, were they fairly similar characters, Greg and Antoine? Uh, yeah, in certain ways. Uh, although if you paid Greg enough, he would definitely stick a pink one on, let's be honest, Greg. Um, no, they were. They're both like really focused on the rugby um, and being the best that they could be, but with like a sort of nice sense of humor with it. Um, not daft, but good fun to be around, good company, enjoyable, um, but really serious about the rugby and serious about being the best they could be. So um, Antoine's probably got a bit more physically on you, I would say. He's probably a bit more explosive. But, can't um, argue with that one, mate. You can't argue there, but like two great scrum half and also good mates, like both good boys. So it's been really nice to... Again, I've passed everything on, everything, everything that I knew on and encouraged them. And, you know, now they are where they are. I'm just so proud of them both. There you go. Uh, no, but they are. Personalities go uh, actually very, quite similar. Yeah. Johnny yeah. had a lovely left foot spiral at him as well. <laughs> he's, he's been quite modest there, mate. Let's 
focus on France a bit more then. Gabon Villiers, Johnny. No Gabon Villiers this weekend. Who comes in for yep. him? Uh, he's probably been the player of the tournament so far for me as well <clears throat> in what he's brought with his defence. Um, he's been outstanding. I think in his absence, he's probably back for the next round. I reckon, I think you probably, again, it's a risk. And it's this This is why it becomes a little bit of a banana skin without being disrespectful to Scotland. But shifting around that back line at this stage when you go to Murrayfield becomes quite dangerous. Um, but if you look at the personnel they've got you'd probably bring Dante straight back into 12 you'd keep Moifana who's been great at 13 and Fiku might almost be shifted to the wing because he's played there a lot for France um, and that I think is where they'd be most comfortable with the changes as a team and as a unit and what they've had before is that the best setup for going to Scotland to try and win at Murrayfield I'm not quite sure but I think with the personnel they have that's what they'll do um, but that's it I think they have to back themselves in their systems um, because I don't like Vakatawa is not going to come back in. He's still coming back to fitness and form with Rassing, um, and and that's what they've got. So for me, um, Dante comes back into twelve again. He was superb against the All Blacks in the autumn. He's a top player. He's been tremendous in top fourteen. Um, and you keep Moifan at thirteen, and you probably push push Fiku, who's defensive leader, which is maybe a difficult thing to do from the wing. Although Villiers has shown that it can be done, you'd stick him back on the wing. So. I think you go Dante, Moifana, and Fiku. I don't know what you do, Greg, if you do something differently. Um, but that seems like the most simple way to to plug it back in. Yeah, they, they've obviously, as you mentioned there, they've obviously used uh, Gail Fiku quite a lot in, on the wing for the French team in the past. So that, that's probably in their thinking, and, and it seems to be the, the easiest, easiest shift around uh, for them. So I would imagine that they probably will go with that. Uh, it's actually really disappointing that Villiers injured, to be fair, because I was really looking forward to see him, see him go up against uh, Darcy Graham, who I think, you know, BC mentioned Villiers probably the player of the tournament. I don't think Darcy can be probably too far behind, uh, you know, certainly after after a couple of games. He's been awesome to watch for, for Scotland and, and a two probably similar in stature, I guess. You know, not big men, but real sort of powerful, explosive. So uh, it's a shame he's not going to play, but yeah, I think, I think they'll go uh, Fiku in the wing. Obviously, a bit more, you know, physical uh, or sort of physically intimidating enemy. But you know, Darcy, Darcy could have some joy uh, there as well because he's a bigger man, uh, Fiku. But you know, Darcy, that's where he's been causing a lot of problems with his, his footwork and uh, you know, in around the big defenders. You both mentioned they've done it before, and Fiku's shifted to the wing in recent years, even though he is their defensive leader. But if you are Scotland and you're Gregor Townsend or you're Chris Harris, are you not looking at that thinking? Yeah, quite quite like that. Would you not rather Gail Fiku moves to the wing than than them play the way they have in recent weeks? Potentially, but it's a dangerous way to look at it. I think it's more the system. So I think Scotland as well. Scotland actually played with a re- almost a hard blitz as well with Chris Harris, totally taking away uh, time and space away from Vakatawa in Paris last year. So it was, it was sort of the same system. But I think for Scotland, it's more... How do you attack against that system? I don't think that they will wait for a Thursday team announcement and plan around that. I think they'll more of a game plan that suits them down to the ground, how they think they can execute against this French team, not against whether it's Jonathan Dante or, or Moifana in the midfield. Um, and that's it. Yeah, I don't think Gregor or the coaching staff are going to approach it any differently. But I think come Thursday, if you are the Scottish midfield and, and Fiku's not there, there's a sort of, not vulnerability, but it's more approachable. I think you think Gail Fiku and you think he's the only guy in this French team with over 50 tests. He's been there. He's defensive leader. He's solid. He takes gain line. And you think maybe if you're going up against Dante Moafana, there's maybe a, a few more chinks in the armor to be, to be exposed, but we'll see what happens on Saturday. But I think generally for Scotland, they will look more as a team, how they want to play, how they want to settle, how they want to execute against this French side, because no matter who they stick in, really this French side at the minute are absolutely flying. And before we move on, you obviously know Ali Price very well. Greg, if you're him and you're trying to strike the balance that Johnny's talking about between sending God knows how many kicks down down France's throat and also creating the kind of tempo that Scotland like to play with, it's a fine balance. How does he approach it? You know, a lot to do with, with the forward pack, him and, and how they're able to carry it. And I think, you know, Gregor's obviously, he, like, he likes to move the ball. Uh, mainly anyway, so I think that will be Scotland's game plan is it, it, to try and move the ball away from the, you know, the, the France's sort of big heavy pack. Um, so it's just that balance uh, in that half back area be- between Ali and Finn and 
they've, they've got a lot of experience between them and now is you know it's, it's when to kick you know why why are you kicking and you know what type of kick so I think that's one thing if you know if Fiku is is playing on the wing it's yeah, that maybe one area you know we can target him a little bit more is, is, is you know that high sort of ball uh, in and around them put it in behind them making them turn you know, and try and catch balls you know up above them and, and really challenge which is a strength in Darcy's uh, game as well so yeah, you know, Ali and, and Finn will run, will run the game. And, uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, when he, when he kicks, his kicks will be on the money. Uh, if he can do that, kick to compete. So I don't think, again, Scotland probably want to keep the ball in play uh, for as long as they can. France have, have really probably improved fitness-wise as well. But, again, Scotland really need to take them uh, to the well and, and really test them this weekend. And that's Scotland are fit. So if it was me, I'd be kicking to compete from, from my end, keeping the ball in the field. Uh, and given France as little set piece as possible. And what time will it be in Japan when it kicks off at Murrayfield on Saturday? And where will you be watching in the, in bed? I'm actually doing a little bit of TV work out here for a, for a Japanese company. Um, obviously, Are with, you with a already? translator. Obviously, oh, with a translator. Being, cheating, mate. Yeah. Otherwise, it could be pretty messy. So, um, yeah, I've done the I've done the um, Welsh game. Um, uh, couple of weeks back there uh, for uh, for the TV company up over here as well so I'm going to do that and uh, so yeah it'd be awesome I get to uh, watch the game live. So. Are you enjoying the TV work or does it make you miss it even more when they're belting out Flyer of Scotland at Murrayfield? Oh I do miss Murrayfield you know, definitely I think it's it's funny you know you don't sometimes you don't miss much about home but seeing the Six Nations uh, you know stuff like that beats seeing beats going back over to Edinburgh, you know, it'd be awesome to, to get back over there and catch up with a few boys for a beer, but uh, it's not to be at the moment. Tim, you know, I've, I've got a, a job to do out here, so get on with it. So, yeah, definitely enjoying, um, you know, staying in touch with it, doing a little bit of TV work and, uh, you know, um, yeah, staying involved in the tournament, I guess. Don't worry, Johnny, we'll have you back in the corporate suites. Soon. Exactly, mate. You'll be back in the Thistle suite before you know it, Greg. Who are you kidding? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Greg will be there flying the flag. Um, mate, obviously, you might have another year, another couple of years in you. You're a spring chicken. Have you thought any more? We touched on Fabian Galti, the job he's doing, another scrum half as a fantastic coach. Yourself, are you thinking about coaching or are you thinking about something completely different? Yeah, but they're both bits thinking about, uh, about uh, a little bit of coaching. Uh, thinking about a few options uh, away from the game as well, which is exciting. I've got a few things uh, on the go at the moment, and I'll probably, you know, look to pull the trigger on uh, one or, or two of them over the next sort of uh, probably six to eight weeks, something like that, and, and really decide what I'm going to do. So um, I'm, I'm already, we've got Rob Penny here uh, this season. He's head coach here at MPT Communications. Uh, he's been really good. So I'm, uh, I've, I've taken over uh, the kicking. Uh, side of things so I'm uh, really enjoying that so obviously playing and, and doing a little bit of kicking uh, coaching as well so that's I guess my you know my first sort of steps into it so yeah really enjoying that and as I said having a, having a look elsewhere and, uh, you know a couple of different options away from the game uh, which I'll decide on it soon as. And side projects talk us through Wolf's Craig for everyone that doesn't know about Wolf's Craig tell us a little bit about that. Wolf Craig. Wolf Craig there you go tell us about that yeah. one not Wolf's Craig. <laughs> Yeah, so Wolf Craig Distillery with a, a, a new whiskey startup, um, obviously from Scotland. Uh, we're going to be based, uh, we're building a brand new distillery uh, this year. It, it's going to be uh, built hopefully by the end of the year. All, all things going well, just uh, near Stirling Castle. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm currently global brand ambassador for them, which, which has been awesome. Uh, trying to learn a lot about uh, the whiskey industry. So a, a lot of uh, Zoom meetings and stuff back in Scotland. Uh, Richard Patterson, he, he's the main guy, master blender, master distiller, along with uh, a number of other really uh, well-experienced people within the team. So, yeah, that's one avenue I'm looking into beats, and uh, I've sort of really enjoyed having something uh, alongside rugby to, to really get stuck into. And, uh, you know, I've been pushing the brand uh, hard out here in, in Japan. It's obviously they want to try and bring the, the um, roof peg out to Japan at some point as well. So I've been really well-placed and, and met a lot of good people so far. So having good fun with that. Let's have a quick word on the other games in round three of the Six Nations as well then. Um, we've obviously had the Six Nations statement in the last week or so claiming Italy's place in the tournament isn't at risk and the makeup of the competition isn't changing. So that's obviously a good thing for them. But it's going to be tough for them, Johnny, isn't it, going to Dublin? Yeah, I'm not expecting much from them in Dublin. Um, 
but I'm more just reassured. Um, like I love the history and again, bringing them in and the work that's been done to bring through, you know, their infrastructure, their behind the scenes, how they're going, their 20, like their under 20s beat England two weekends ago. Last year, the under 20s thumped Scotland by 40 points. So it's coming. It just, it's a question of patience. Um, and where it's nearly finally there, it'd be a real shame to turf them out after all the work that's been done. There's some fantastic work. And Treviso as well, some of their performances in the URC have been, have been top drawers. So Look, they're decent now to watch for 50 minutes. They were good against France for 50 minutes. They were good in fits and starts. They managed to get to England's 22, I think it was something like 17 times without scoring a point in Rome, which is unfortunate. But I don't know what Greg's view is, but I've got no interest in seeing South Africa in the Six Nations. I'm not sure if I'm a traditionalist or if I'm boring or it's a European competition. I love it. I've grown up with it. I can't see people from the valleys getting on a flight to go and watch games in Cape Town. Um you're going to add another fixture and make it a seven nations when there's already fixture pileups in France. There's double weekends coming out everyone's ears already. There's just so many reasons for me why it's a no. Um, and there's so many reasons in it why there should be a bit of loyalty um, to Italy. They had a fantastic generation with Parise, with Castro Giovanni, Canali, when those players came through. And we hope that would, you know, kick them on. That was a golden generation of players. Um, and so we're hoping now the next ones are about to burst through and it's looking like it is. There's shoots of something really positive. So there's a lot of frustration for me. The next European nation is miles away from Italy. We've had all the questions about Georgia there, way off. Um, and I, for one, have got no interest in seeing South Africa in the tournament. I think if you looked around social media and everybody's views, I think everybody can have the same take on it. The tournament's so strong. Uh, and it's partly, you know, because of the fans, and, you know, and that sort of, you know, like this close proximity as well, which helps, you know, everywhere's not too far away, a couple of hours flights match, you know, you know, down LA, down to France. And, and I think, and that's been built up in, in, over the years. And I think, you know, as, as Beats has, has sort of touched on there, it, it doesn't happen overnight. And, and yeah, everybody's probably a little bit frustrated that, you know, early I've, I've struggled over the last, you know, however many years it is, but there's, now it does seem to be substance coming in, in behind it with, with the way their under 20s are performing and, and they have to be given credit for that um, because you know when you get up to the Six Nations these games they're won on, on small margins a lot of the time you put some of the best teams in the world so it's, it is difficult for Italy who are you know you know in around that 10th 12th you know placed ranked team in the world so it is always going to be difficult so I think if they can push these next crop of under 20 players through uh, you know, they can start to hopefully again challenge and, and get close to teams for the, the next couple of seasons and really see that improvement. I think for me, yeah, as well, it, it's a really difficult one because you're always trying to keep growing the game to that sort of global audience and bringing it into a, a global season as well. But it just doesn't feel like the right move, probably uh, this, certainly at this moment in time, bringing a, somebody like South Africa in. And, you know, there's all sort of obviously knock on effect. You know, if you do that as well, where does that leave New Zealand? Where does that leave, you know, Australia in terms of uh, the rugby championship stuff as well? And England Wales is always a big one. So have Wales got it in them to beat England at Twickenham after beating Scotland, Johnny? No. Nah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think with two key men, so England looked a little bit toothless. Um, I think if you bring back Manny Tuolagi and Courtney Laws, it starts to look a little bit different. Um and where they were a little bit tentative or not quite sure or where they looked like they were hardwired or overcoached and kicking ball away against Scotland time after time again. I think if you are taking gain line, there are clearer pictures, there are overlaps that form. And I think they've got enough in them between the way they're coached, between the personnel they've got and between that edge physically that's brought back with Manu and Courtney um, that they should definitely have enough to, to, do, um, to do Wales at Twickers. So I don't see Wales going there this year and winning. Uh, Falatau backs a big boost for Wales uh, as well. Another X-Factor player, somebody coming back in and bolstering that back row with all the injuries they've had. But I just see England at home um, being too strong for Wales. I probably agree with, with Beats on, on that one. I think England back at the Twickenham as well. Uh, the, the first couple of games being away from home, I think it's, it's massive for them. And I think, you know, I'm the same. Against Scotland, they, they kind of just kept kicking us the ball. For me, it was just incredible. <laughs> you know, it's a couple of things, it was really, uh, yeah, it was, it was just bizarre because England have got some excellent players, you know, excellent running players as well. 
And now you've got, you know, Marcus Smith is in there as well. He, he can really put boys in a, in a position that he's a player in the similar mode to, to somebody like Finn. So, um, yeah, I see, you know, England probably getting back on, on stride and, and winning that. And, you know, Wales, obviously, they're always going to be up for it. And they showed that against Scotland, uh, really sort of digging in. They've done really well to dig out a, a fairly good performance after, after struggling week one. But I think you're yeah, going away to Twickenham. It's going to be a big ask, and, and I'm not sure the Welsh attack is up to causing England's defence enough problems uh, to get them over the line. So I think England are going to win that one. Well, we've chatted a bit about the games, so let's get your predictions in for the Guinness Pint Predictor from Match Pint now. If you haven't had a go yet, it definitely isn't too late to join in. And there's a chance to win a pint of Guinness with every game as well as weekly prizes. All you have to do is pick the winner of each game, how many they'll win by, and don't forget to enter our league with the code LaRugby once you've downloaded the Match Pint app as well. You're going to be doing Bendy's predictions, Greg. And <laughs> when I say no You'll pressure, do a better job. I genuinely mean it. No pressure at all. <laughs> apparently, did you hear this, Johnny? Apparently, a little birdie told me he picked Italy to beat England by 35 in round two. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether that I'm, was a mistake or not, but... I'm not quite sure he's got his head around the technology and the app yet, but it's actually very <laughs> simple to use. So don't be dissuaded by Benji's incompetence and stupidity. It's actually very straightforward. But yes, I did see that he chose <laughs> Italy by 35 and I didn't have the heart to tell him because I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> That takes the pressure off me a bit this week. Though. Genuinely no pressure. We will start with you, Greg. Ireland, Italy, what's going to happen? Oh, yeah, Ireland are going to win fairly well. Uh, England put 33 in them. I'm going to say it's going to be running around that same margin, probably. You know, Ireland, yeah, 42 to 10 ish, something like that. I'm going bigger. Um... Yeah. I'm going to go Ireland by 40. I just think in Dublin, away from home, um, they're just too... I, I, even it doesn't matter if, if Carberry starts at 10, I'd be really interested to see him start another game um, after his first Six Nations start last week against France. Um, so I, I kind of hope for generate some depth, they leave Sexton out again or they stick him on the bench, they start Carberry, but there'll be some other people come in, maybe potentially Henderson might come in um, to second row. But I just think with the strength and depth and the way they're playing and the speed with which they are playing, uh, Italy've got no chance. I'm going to go Ireland by 40. England, Wales, Johnny? Um, I don't want to say comfortable, but I think this is maybe the game where England click into gear. It's their first real test, like after slipping up really at Murrayfield first round. Uh, Italy away was easy at a canter. Um, I think it'll be more of a grind, but I think they've got enough to dispatch Wales I'm going to go England by 13 yeah I think it's I think that's a fairly solid prediction it beats to be fair I think as I mentioned before England back in Twickenham uh, too Lange back involved Laws uh, seems to be back in the mix they, they two players are going to make them a big difference as well and, uh, you know, Wales probably still pretty badly affected by injury across the board so I'm going to go yeah England by uh, about yeah, 24 12 something like that so, I thought you were saying yeah. England by 24 I was like holy <laughs> no 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 um, yeah so it's so roughly the same winning margin and then the big one I don't know if it's heart versus head or not but Greg Scotland France yeah as well since it's Benji's um, thing I can say whatever I like <laughs> <laughs> uh, that predictions I'm 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 going with the boys I think they can do it the uh, Yes, France are excellent. Um, Scotland do really need to play well for 80 minutes and really, really well at that, but, but they can't do that. They've beaten them the last couple of times. I'm going Scotland by six points. Pressure's on, Johnny. Uh, my head says France by about nine or ten. Um, I just think the firepower, the way they're playing... Um, I don't know. I just think they've been too good to watch. Um, and if this was going to be their time, it would be it, which is unfortunate for Scotland. They would have to go to Edinburgh and win if they were going to win this championship. My heart says Scotland have beaten them the last two times they've played. They're at Murrayfield. All the other big sides have won all their home games and nobody's fallen really away from... Nobody's fallen at home as yet. So I would say Scotland by two. Um, I'm so going to wait. your heart says one thing. Yeah, yeah. Your head says another. Two very different things. 
What is your match playing predictor say? <laughs> My match playing predictor says I'm going to wait and see the team sheet come out on oh. Thursday and make a decision. Oh, um, but, oh, mate, it could go either way. Um, I'm going to go France by four. Right, let's just touch on the top 14 briefly before we go as well. And, Johnny, every week at the moment, I ask you about Toulouse. This is officially now their worst run in the top 14. Six defeats in a row. Yep. They lost to Poe. Poe were down to 14 after 33 minutes, down to 13 for the last half an hour. They've got Bordeaux at home to lose next, I think. Then they've got Stad yep. away, Montpellier at home. Tough run of fixtures. Yep. Should we worry yet? Uh, it's more the manner. Um, it's the fact they're playing against 13 men and poured down by two in a back line. So they haven't taken anyone off their scrum to defend and to lose us, trying to maul them, they're trying to scrum them. You, you like just basic decision make, like simple things. They're, they're two down in a back line, so try and stretch them, and they didn't do it. Um, Poe, actually, to be fair to them, were fantastic to watch for the first 60 minutes of that game. They were exceptional. They're now becoming really well organized with a team that don't have many stars, a new head coach who's come from the under 20 setup. Um, and they absolutely blew them off the pitch for 50 minutes. And it was only the red cards that allowed to lose back into the game at all. But even with a two-man advantage, they still couldn't produce anything decent. So to lose, it's worrying. Um, I think once they get everyone back from the French side, they'll be fine. But mentally, I don't know where they are. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what they're saying before games at half times or problem solving on field. They just seem rudderless. So it's really weird to watch. And you talked about that run of games. They're going to go to board. They've got Bordeaux at home, but Bordeaux have just lost to Racing, so they'll send the big dogs to Toulouse because they know they're vulnerable. Away to Stad, who absolutely blitzed Biritz at the weekend, and Montpellier, who are currently second. So they've got a really, really tough stretch of games. The next three are going to be very hard to get through without their international. So I think if they can get through that and take potentially one win out of those three games, they'll be doing well based on how they're currently playing, which is bizarre to say for Toulouse, but they're in a bit of a pickle. Um, so worrying, but I think even if they get through these games with one win, once they get their internationals back, they should be firing. But just really bizarre to watch. Really, really strange. You know what it's like, Greg, when the Six Nations is on. Oh, that Toulouse side is decimated, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And the guys that go away, they're obviously you know, big players and probably big characters within their team as well. And as soon as they pick up a you know one defeat, two defeats, and these guys are not there to turn to. That that's when it becomes difficult. And uh, you know, as Beach sort of touched on, it's it's probably more that decision making or you know on the field, you know, in the moment and in the top fourteen, it, it it's it's a slog. And it, you know, if you just fall on the right side, t- teams can sense that and they really go for you and make it really difficult. So they're going to have to, you know, try and dig themselves out of that in the next you know two or three games by the by the big dogs are. Are still away on, on international duty. They've, they've still got good players back there, but it's just that confidence thing. And what about the red cards in that game, Johnny? You couldn't get too clear of reds, could you? Um, no, and the second one was horrible. Um, the first one by Manu on Alban Placine, which is just a quite a, doesn't look like a proper punch, but almost like a swinging arm to he's having his jersey pulled, he's off the ball, just get rid of me. I thought that was a little bit soft for red. I thought that could have been a yellow. But the second one was absolutely brutal. I'm not sure if you've seen it on social media, Greg, but Batabua, who, again, is a superb centre, like great to watch every weekend for Poe. He's, he's been sensational for them, but flies out the line, spot blitzes Choco Barres, the Argentinian centre, nowhere near the ball. Again, hit shoulder to head, head to head. I'm not sure what it is, but I mean, KO'd before he even hits the deck, just absolutely horrible to watch. So miss time, messy. And one of the most clean-cut red cards you could see with the current laws and guidelines, and brutal to watch. So, I mean, the good news was that Choco Barres was out of hospital on the Monday. That was the one thing because you're just so worried. I mean, the force that Vatabua comes out of the line and strikes him, you're just hoping and touching wood that he's okay. But he's now out of hospital. Um, came out on Monday morning, back to the club, back to recover, and you just hope that he doesn't have serious repercussions because that was a brutal hit. It was absolutely horrible. What was he thinking there? I mean. He never got the ball, Chocobaras. He never... Did he just guess? Yeah. That's, <laughs> mate, I, I don't know. He's, he's gone... I don't, to, I don't think he was thinking. <laughs> I, that's it. Maybe he's not... But it's a complete mistime. So he's trying to affect the defensive line. He's trying to spot blitz. He's trying to slow things down. But he's not watching the ball at all. 
and again, you're taught to always be scanning between the man that you're defending against and the ball, keeping a picture. You can go for an intercept or you can go for the ball when you blitz like that and he just has not timed it or watched the ball at all. Choco Barras hasn't got any, anywhere near the ball and he's nearly decapitated them. So brutal to watch, a uh, horrible miss time and a horrible piece of defensive play by actually a, a really fantastic rugby player. So fingers crossed Choco Barras gets back fit quickly. He doesn't have too many long-term repercussions and that Vatabua doesn't do it again because it was messy. And your old team, Greggy, Clermont, they, they came back, they got a bonus point against La Rochelle, but are you keeping up with them? What, what do you make of them generally this season, uh, Johnny Gibbs? Yeah, I keep up and, uh, you know, and have a look in and I think uh, they obviously seem to be struggling uh, a little bit. Someone just seems to be uh, not quite clicking uh, in place, I think. You know, probably around that nine, nine, ten axis. I think. Um, you know, I don't know if Getting that's been announced or anything. But... <laughs> Getting back is what he's saying. <laughs> no, 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 They're just no, struggling no. at nine and ten. Get me back. But I think because I don't know if that's been announced, but there, there's rumours. Uh, you know, Morgan's moving on um, uh, to, to somewhere. I'm not too sure where. Potentially up to Paris. Uh, Cami Lopez is obviously he, he's going down to to buy on. I think. Uh, beats or Bayon. Yep. Yep. Um, he, he's had a nurse, so and I think they don't seem to be, have been playing too much, and that that's been you know a sort of fulcrum of the team uh, there for a long time, and really settled, and and, and sort of everybody sort of knew uh, where they stood, and I think probably after Frank leaving as well, you know, all the sort of players you know understood how he worked day in day out, and uh, and they're probably just getting used to Jono as well. But by all accounts, John is an excellent coach. Sadly, I just missed them uh, from my time in Claremont, but you know, I'm sure I'm sure he'll get them going and you know get, get them to the end of the season. But you know, for whatever reason, at this moment in time, they, they seem to be not clicking 100. percent And as we touched on before, you know, like to lose if you load confidence, team sense that they go for you, and, and there's no hiding places in the, in the top 14. And we mentioned Racing earlier on, Johnny. They had their bad run mm-hmm. before Christmas, and they're flying now. Five wins in a row, winning away at Bordeaux. They are as well, but I think it was how they were losing. So again, their scrum was on roller skates. They've obviously signed a certain tight head from South Africa who's shoring things up for them. Finn was back again um, in the fallow week. Once you get all these players back, again, the, the top end of the table now, the teams are so good and they're all traveling. So when, when Greg and I played, away games were almost, they weren't really considered serious games. Whereas now they see the importance of these points and how precious they are. If you can travel and you can pick up points on the road, you're absolutely flying. Um, and Bordeaux, to be fair, they've been wonderful to watch all year. Um, and they are a very, very hard to beat team. And so for Racing to go there and pick up that result, that's, that's, that's a big one. That's a huge one for them. And you could see how delighted they were after in the change rooms um, and the celebrations. But again, you just look back at the, at the table, Bordeaux still top, Montpellier picking up a draw at the weekend away to breathe. They're still second. But after you get past fourth, it's just amazing the teams that are out of it. So like La Rochelle currently eighth, who were first, second last season. You've got Clermont down in 10th and Toulon 12th. Like it just shows how competitive it's become. And again, the movement towards Gif, all, encouraging all these young kids to be perform, performing week in, week out amongst these senior heads. It's become a tough league o- overnight. It's always been tough, but even for big teams with big budgets, it's becoming tougher and tougher. So again, we had Stade Francais, a disaster start. They smashed beer at the weekend. They're up to seventh. They're doing exactly what they did last year. So it's constant movement, never quite settled. And anybody on their day can beat any other team. So it's exciting to watch. And the top 14, I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in there. Even as a big team now, I'm glad to be retired because the pressure of those boys at Toulon must be under. You see Etzebeth announcing he's leaving. He's heading back to South Africa, going to the Sharks. And you don't blame him. Like, it does not look like a happy place or a settled place to be. And they're not performing. So... Tough old gig this year, the top 14. Um, and you could see potentially one of the big teams going down and potentially two or three teams with massive budget not even making the top six this year. It's about off and picking a fight with Backy's Boater as well. That's one we all avoid, I think. Yeah. Pay-per-view, get it in. <laughs> right, it's about time we did our meter moment of the week, isn't it? So do you want to take it away, Johnny? Yep, meter moment of the week this week. The best bit of rugby action uh, from the top 14 because there was no Six Nations. Um, and strangely, even though they got smashed with two of the worst red cards you'll see all season, um, the performance by Poe, I thought was exceptional. Um, so two bits to pick out. Piccaroni's, the former under-20s coach, who I think is doing a very good job there. But 
an individual performance, a man that I thought that stood out. He's on loan from Racing and working with his former coach in the 20s is Jordan Joseph. And he's had massive amounts of, not pressure, but expectation placed on him as the next big thing in French rugby and never quite kicked on at Racing. That's why he's on loan. Um, but he was absolutely phenomenal the way he carried the ball, the way he was contesting, the way he was tackling. Um, just absolutely all action performance. So my meter moment of the weekend this week goes to Jordan Joseph, who finally looks like he's getting somewhere and becoming the player we all want him to be. And he might not make the 23, but called up to the front squad this week as well. Yep, has been rewarded. Um, and that's he's a unit as well. You think back traditionally the, the French eights that we've played against Louis Picamol. I mean, he is an absolute unit. So I think before long, he'll be in that squad and he'll be capped. If he'll be in and about for 2023 for the World Cup, I don't know. But certainly for the future, um, he's going to be in around the top 14 for a few years to come and he will pick up a few caps. He's a talented boy and a physical athlete. So one to watch for the future. And he was my meter moment of the weekend, this performance for Paul. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 11 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com and get 10% off any full price item with the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout as well. Plus, from the 11th of February to the 11th of March, you can be in with a chance of winning a trip to Marcus Borden's UK Barbecue School in the heart of the Devon countryside with every purchase of an ultimate bundle. Just find the golden ticket. I'm Charlie, and this is my chocolate factory. <laughs> and enjoy a day in the smoky, meaty paradise of Countrywood Smoke HQ. For more details and to be in with a chance to win, just visit meter.com and look for the ultimate bundle. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Greg. And a big thanks to all you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can as well. Check us out on Rugby Pass as well as on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, guys. Cheers, Greg. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Bye.